Kat, I'm so excited to find someone who's ready to take action and get things done. Oh, man, I am that girl. Exactly. Yeah. I've got something perfect for you, so oh. let's get started. Okay. <sighs> what are you doing? Uh, stand up. Remember, we were going to take action. Yeah, but this is where I always sit. Right, but I need more than this. Oh, I know what you're getting at. Okay, Jesus, how much do you want? What? $50, is that enough? Oh, uh, that's not what I meant. Oh, uh, all right, well, a hundred then, you know. I mean, you drive a hard bargain. Uh, um, okay, but, um, you might not want to cash this till next Friday, you know what I'm saying? Right. There you go. <laughs> okay, okay, Kat, really, I, I do think it's great that you want to give, but I want you to mentor a younger woman. Ooh, yeah, right. Well, Jesus, you know, I'm not really into, like, teaching people and stuff. I mean, I'm not, I don't really get into that. Okay, um, okay, you, you know that woman at the office, Amy? Yeah. I want you to take her out to lunch. Tell her about me. Um, well, Amy is different. I mean, like, really different, you know? I know, but she needs to know about me. Mm, and I can tell the people at the church to call her. I mean, they get paid to do things like that. I want you to do that. Jesus, I just don't feel comfortable doing that. <laughs> no, Kat, the problem is you're too comfortable. <laughs> Comfort. Or contributing Th those are really the choices aren't they a am I okay with being comfortable or am I gonna do something that pulls me out of that comfort zone and I'm gonna contribute in some way we're wrapping up this series we've called church is a verb and today we're talking about this idea of contributing and there's a story in 2nd Samuel chapter 23 about some guys who chose contributing over comforting. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and turn there. 2 Samuel 23. The difference is comfort thinks about self. Contributing is concerned about others. Comfort is about being the recipient. Contributing is about being the giver. Comfort's about the immediate. Contributing is about the future. Comfort looks for the easy road. Contributing looks for the significant one. 1989, two brothers from Boston started a t-shirt business and for five years, Bert and John traveled the East Coast hawking off their t-shirts, eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, sleeping in their van, showering when they could. Uh, as they tell it, they didn't do very well, they didn't make much money and the chicks weren't impressed. And so in the summer of 94, they arrived home from a road trip with $78 in their pocket, about ready to give up. And that's when they created a little smiling stick figure they named Jake, and a simple phrase that inspired them and their imagination, life is good. And inspired by their new friend and by his grin, they emptied their bank account, they printed up 48 t-shirts, they went to a street fair in Cambridge, and by noon, they had sold out of all of these t-shirts, and they become not just a business, but they become a movement. Uh, Bert and John were no longer just selling clothes, they were on a mission to spread good vibes wherever they could, and, 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 and now, Life is Good, Inc. is a $150 million company with thousands of outlets. It's a movement that has raised millions of dollars for charity. It's drawn people together. It's shaped a culture. It's, it's prompted optimism and simplicity and goodness. And my guess is there are many of you that have one of those, those T-shirts. There's something we love about a story like that, isn't there? Maybe, maybe it's because that a couple of down and out guys made it good. Or maybe it's because we're glad there's still a market for just simplicity and quality. Or maybe it speaks to the longing that 
all of us have, the longing of making a difference, the, the longing of, of being able to do some work that is significant and that we can make a difference in the world because I, I think there is built within all of us this desire to make a difference, this desire to contribute. I, I want to introduce you to another set of brothers uh, not blood brothers, but brothers nonetheless, their story in that text that I had you turn to, 2 Samuel 23. It's a story of courageous contribution. In fact, that's what these brothers are remembered for. They're active contributing. Their legacy is what they did. Their legacy is what they contributed. It's what's remembered about them. And here we are 3,000 years talking about them. It's the story that includes David of the Old Testament, and, and, and he relied, the text tells us, on at least 30 special men who were prominent to him, who were significant to him. They were uh, 30 of his, what they called mighty men. That's what they were known as, David's mighty men. And the story we're going to talk about took place shortly after David was made king, but not everybody uh, uh, went along with his kingship. Uh, shortly after David was made king, the Philistines attacked and they attacked God's people and in, 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 in leading up to this moment we're going to find ourselves God has gathered a group of people they've been sent to David they've gathered around him and they have committed to help David accomplish God's mission that God had given him before we get into our text which is actually about verse 13 skip back with me to verse 8 I want to point out some of these guys a guy with a big name named Josheb Bashabeth or Joshabim if, if if you want to go with his short name found in first Chronicles 11 a kind of a parallel passage that goes along with this uh, this guy named Joshabim was chief of the captains in David's army. He was famous for slaying 800 people with just his sword all by himself at one time. And we're not told how he accomplished that feat, what he did, but it speaks volume of his heroism. If you look at verse 9, you find out about a guy named Eliezer. Eliezer fought side by side with David against the Philistines. While the rest of the army was retreating in fear, he and David stood their ground. The Bible says that Eliezer fought until his sword was frozen or welded onto his hand. He couldn't let go of it. And the Lord honored his faith and the courage of David, and they gave him a great victory. And uh, it wasn't until the armies returned to strip the dead that uh, they were joined by their, their uh, uh, fellow soldiers. Skip down to verse 11, and you read about a guy named Shema. When everyone else ran off, this guy risked his life to defend a field of lentils and barley. Why would he do that? Well, because the land belonged to the Lord, and, and he wasn't about to let the Philistines mock his God. He didn't want the Philistines to control what belonged to the Lord, so he stood his ground and honored God and this covenant that, that they had made. That's the setup for the story that we find beginning uh, there in just the next few verses. Now, in the story, it says there are three guys. We're not told that it was these three guys that I just mentioned that we read preceding the story, but there's good reason to think that maybe it is. And so read with me, if you will, beginning verse 13. During harvest time, Three of the thirty chief men came down to David at the, cave, at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. And so the three mighty men broke through the Philistine lines. They drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, O Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives, and David would not drink it? The text tells us that David was camping out at a cave near Bethlehem. It was harvest time. It would have been a dry time. So there was probably a lack of water. And David was thirsty from the water at a specific well in Bethlehem. That's significant because that's where David grew up in Bethlehem. 
He would have been familiar with this place. He would have drank water from it often. And so he was thinking, or reminiscing about uh, that water that he had grown up. Now, I grew up in, in kind of central Kansas. It is over one of the largest salt veins in the world, and the water does not taste very good in Kansas there. I cannot relate to this story. That does not make sense for me to long for water that was back where I grew up, but that's the case for David right here. He is longing for that water. He has fond memories of it, and he thinks to himself, I wish I had that, maybe even speaks that out loud, and then three of his men spring into action. They act. They deliver. And in this story, I want you to notice four things about their act of contributing that I think are significant for us. Here, here's the first one. I want you to write it down. Love is what motivates it. Th these guys acted out of love. They didn't do it because they were commanded to. They did it because they loved David. They didn't have to be commanded. They didn't have to be told. They really didn't have to be encouraged. Just the knowledge that their king and their friend wanted something caused them to, to, to act. And, 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 and they were so committed and enthusiastic in their service that they jumped to their feet. They marched off with a, mis with a mission. His wish was truly their command. Now, we operate out of different motivations. We serve from different motivations. Sometimes we contribute, we help, we serve, we minister because of guilt. We do it because we feel like we have to. And maybe in church at some point in time, a leader kind of pulled this guilt thing on you and you felt like you had to, and maybe you've been teaching a class or maybe you've been helping in an area because you were motivated by guilt. Sometimes our motivation is responsibility. We feel like we ought to. And there are many responsible uh, folks in church that show up and they just have this sense of loyalty and responsibility. And you ask them to do something and they, they come through. They contribute. Sometimes there is this idea of reward. How many of you have ever given something and you were glad to get, maybe you gave some money to a, a, an organization and you got a mug in return or you got a t-shirt in return. You went, I'd like to have that. I'll, I'll give them five bucks. I'll give them 10 bucks. And you know, you helped the Boy Scouts and you got a tub of popcorn or whatever it was. You got some kind of reward from that. You felt good about, but the, you did it for that, that reason. I, I remember when I was in Bible college, I taught a small uh, Sunday school class in a small rural church. I got started there because a cute little girl asked me to help, okay? And uh, I did that so I could spend more time with her. There was kind of this reward thing for me, you know? I was doing this thing. I was doing a good thing, but I did it because of what I could get out of it. There's also this idea of motiva being motivated by need, and a lot of us uh, act out of need. We see something. Somebody shows us a reason to help out, a reason to contribute, and, and we know it needs to be done, and we jump in and we fulfill it. Now, you know what? None of those motivations are bad. We have all done something for not the best of motivations, but it has caused us to grow, and it's caused us to be in a place where we have the highest motivation. John 3.16 tells us about God's motivation. For God so loved the world that he gave, he contributed. God's motivation for giving his son Jesus to this world was love. He didn't feel like he had to. He didn't feel like he needed to. He didn't feel like he ought to. There was certainly no reward for God. It was simply the fact that he loved his creation and the greatest motivation for you and I contributing is when we do that out of our love for God. Contributing. There's a second thing I want you to pick up from this story, and that is that challenge is what makes it satisfying. There is something about the challenge that I have when I serve and when I contribute in some way 
that, that causes me when there's that challenge to enjoy that, to see it as, to get some kind of satisfaction. We're told in the text that, that uh, uh, they were in this place they called the Valley of Rephim. It, it, that word actually means giant. And, and these guys that we're about to see are up against a pretty uh, a giant task. In fact, the Philistines had established a permanent military installation. That's what it's talking about there when it says garrison. It's a permanent military installation within the walled city of Bethlehem. They had already conquered Jerusalem, the city of David. They had already demonstrated their power, the might of their army. But in spite of the dangers, in spite of the consequences, these three guys, they traveled 12 miles undercover. They broke through enemy lines. They drew water from a public well, and they brought it back. David's men were prepared to risk life and limb to please their king. It was a huge challenge. They were ready to put their lives on the line in obedience to the Lord. It was dangerous, it was risky, and it was rewarding for them. I mean, here we are 3,000 years later. We're, we're reading about this adventure. We're reading about this, this thing that they did. And you know what, if, if we're honest, for some of you, the challenge of contributing, the danger of contributing, is what keeps you from doing it. You're a little nervous, a little scared of what might happen. Maybe you're thinking, I, I couldn't do that. I, I couldn't help those people. I couldn't say that. Not good with kids. I'm not good in front of people. And it has prevented you, the challenge has prevented you from contributing. On the other hand, some of you have tackled some difficult areas and God has blessed you tremendously. And, 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 and you think of the satisfaction that you receive and, and it just drives you, it motivates you. You know, one of the most profound teachings of Jesus is this. It is more blessed to give than to receive. More blessed to give than to receive. Key word is blessed. Jesus doesn't say it's better to give. Jesus doesn't say you're supposed to give. Jesus doesn't even say God wants you to give. He says it's more blessed. Your life is going to be enriched. You will be given more life. Your life is going to be enhanced when you give. Heard about a study done of young people, students who were in high school who were below grade reading level. And they took these kids and they assigned them randomly to one of two groups. One of the groups simply did this. They helped tutor younger children. The other group didn't do anything. No volunteering, no serving. There was no teaching done in this. There was no instruction given here. And this is what they found. The students who were in the serving group ended up being 12 times more likely to graduate from high school than the students who were in the non-serving group. The students who tutored other students were the ones that were 12 times more likely to graduate. They didn't receive any help. They were helping High school students involved in volunteering, we just know this from studies, less likely to drop out, less likely to be involved in substance abuse, less likely to be a candidate for teenage pregnancy, more likely to graduate, more likely to vote, more likely to have a higher level of esteem, more likely to go on to college. It is, Jesus said, more blessed to give, to contribute. There's a reward. A third thing I want you to write down on this idea of contributing, we learn from these guys, is that teamwork makes it more enjoyable. When we do things as a team, when we contribute with a group of other people, there is just something that causes some, uh, an enjoyment factor. I think it's significant that they mentioned the three of these guys that did this. They did it together. We could talk about the encouragement that takes place. We could talk about the camaraderie that happens, the, the unity that takes place. There are lots of reasons, but when we serve together, it just makes it more enjoyable. I remember the first trip that our, our church took to Mexico over spring break to build homes. I, I was a part of that. It was a small group, 
We crossed the border. We got there late in the evening. We set up camp in the dark. Some of you that have gone, you can relate to some of this. The ground was so hard, we couldn't get the tent stakes in. It was so windy, we could hardly hold the tents up so we could set them up. It was so cold that when we got up the next morning, our drinking water was frozen. It was so cold that night, and there was so little firewood, we were burning broken up pieces of furniture that I don't know where the people had gotten it from, but we were glad to burn it. Larry Smith, good friend of mine, you know, member here at the church, uh, he and I shared a tent. Um, he accidentally packed his son's sleeping bag that if you know Larry, he's a tall guy. I think it went to about this high on him. It was so cold that uh, he had a pair of sweatpants wrapped around his head. He was so cold with that short sleeping bag that he said, hey, Greg, before you get in your sleeping bag, will you duct tape mine so it won't slide down on me? It was absolutely miserable on that trip. The conditions were miserable. But Larry Smith was with me. Bob King, I think your wife, was with me on that trip. Shelly King, one of our counselors at Hope Center. Brian King, our Sepulpa campus minister, was on that trip. Ryan Dodd, one of our missionaries who serves in North Africa, was on that trip. And you know what? We had an absolute ball. Because when you serve together, when you contribute together, it just makes it more enjoyable. There was a general who was reviewing a platoon of paratroopers in Vietnam. And as he went down the line, he asked each one of these jumpers, each one of these paratroopers, the same question. How do you like jumping, son? The first one said, like it, sir, love it. To the next one, he said, how do you like jumping? Greatest experience in my life, love it. How do you like jumping, he asked the third one. I hate it, sir. Why do you do it, asked the general because I want to be around the guys who love to jump. There's just something about that joy that we get when we do it together. There's a joy when we serve together, contributing. One more thing. Significance, that's what sustains it. That's what keeps us doing it. When we recognize that what we're doing is significant, it keeps us going. That's why there are some of you out here that have been serving in your ministry, you've been doing your role, you've been working in the community at some nonprofit organization, and you've done it for 10 years, or 20 years, or 40 years, because you see what you're doing as so important. I mean, this story that we read has, an, a pretty, has a pretty amazing end to it. You know, when they bring him that water and David looks into that cup or whatever it was, he didn't see water. What he saw was the blood of three men who had risked their lives to satisfy his water. And David decided that to drink that water would cheapen their bravery and their courage. And instead, what he do, did was he poured out that water as a drink offering to the Lord. It was an act of dedication that symbolized their lives being poured out in service of the Lord. These three men, they had sacrificed themselves to the Lord to serve David. They saw what they did as significant. It wasn't just retrieving some water to them. And it wasn't just receiving some water to David. David saw what they did as holy. And he went, this is too sacred. This is too holy to drink. And, 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 he, and he pours the water out. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself the first time I remember hearing this story, what? After all that trouble? After what those guys did for you, you just poured it out? But after you process this, after you think this, what David did, it gave their act of service significance. David said, what you did was so valuable, I, I can't waste it by drinking it. 
David said, this, this is too significant for me to, uh, to consume, and, and, and he recognized what they did as holy. Make sure you understand this. Whenever you are serving, contributing, ministering in some way, your contribution is far more than just a need you are meeting. It's far more than just teaching some kids. It's far more than just shaking some hands. It's far more than just serving some homeless people. Your service, your ministry, your, con your contribution becomes an act of worship to God. Romans 12, 1 says, Since God has shown us great mercy, I beg you to offer your lives as a living sacrifice to Him. Your offering must be only for God and pleasing to Him, which is the spiritual way for you to worship. Offer your lives, it says, as a living sacrifice. That's what, what we do. What we contribute becomes a living sacrifice to God. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest contributors to the Christian faith, Philippians 2.17 says this, I will rejoice even if I lose my life. And he uses some of the same terminology, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God. That's what Paul's saying. My life, I, I give it to God. It's like pouring it all out for him. Just like, he says, your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Paul says, I've already experienced it. I've poured my life out before God. Would you please get a taste of that? Would, would, would you please contribute in some way where you can share in that joy with me? He's saying that your, your service, your contributing is like making a sacrifice to God. You're just pouring it out on the altar. If we could just see how truly significant our contributing is, our service is, our ministry is, it would keep us doing it for eternity. Many years ago in the city of Minneapolis, a church called Bethlehem Baptist Church, they needed a Sunday school teacher for the junior boys. There had never been a teacher that could control them. If you've ever taught the junior boys, you know exactly what they're talking about. It wasn't that they were bad kids. They were just energetic kids. Ewald Chaldberg, a Swedish man, was asked to teach the class, and he took it. Now, the buzz around church was this. He's not going to last very long. He's not going to make it. Those boys will run him out like he ever, he's, they've done everybody else. Three weeks, we're giving him three weeks, and that'll be it. But somehow, Ewald, Ewald Chaldberg believed God when he took the class, and he stayed with it for years, teaching those boys. There was a time later on that they were doing a 10-year celebration a celebration of the 10th anniversary of Ewald Chalberg's death. That's how significant this guy came to be in the church. That's how, how, how important his role was. They're celebrating the 10th anniversary of his death. During the service, they recounted that at least 40 men were in Christian service someplace in the world because one person taught those boys and loved them and watched them as they grew up. They said on the morning of this, this anniversary celebration, 27 people stood up and said, we're going to be like Ewald Schalberger. We're going to be like him in some small way. And so this, this obscure Swedish immigrant, Swedish-speaking person, faithful in service, became significant in this church. If we could just see how significant our contribution is. I heard about an email that was sent to a guy named Dave Workman. Dave is a pastor at a church in Cincinnati. They just prompted their church to do uh, ministry, and specifically out in the community. Find some way that you can just bless people. Find some creative way that you can just touch people's lives in the name of the Lord got this email back from one guy who took him up on that challenge. 
email said, today was fun. It was a pretty normal work day in most senses, but I decided to do things a little differently. It was time to start serving people in the name of the Lord. I went to the soda machine and began purchasing cans of pop. I rubber banded a connect card from our church to each soda, and I placed them back in the dispenser slot. After I secretly placed the cans in the dispenser, I went on my daily routines. I couldn't help but spy it a little and check back. I saw a woman who looked like she was having a bad day. She grabbed one of the free sodas from the machine and began reading the card. This is to let you know that God loves you. She looked as if she'd just been thrown a life preserver. I felt a lump in my throat and had to turn away. I noticed today that this is more addictive than crack cocaine. I couldn't wait to do more and more of it. I ran up to the grocery store. I set a connect card in a corner on and a quarter on every gumball machine. By the time I was leaving the store, there was only one card left. I feel like I'm on fire. I can't wait for the outreach on Saturday. This is the life Jesus promises. If we could see how significant our contributing is. As one guy said, it would be more addicting than crack cocaine. Can I just leave you with maybe some things for you to think about for this year? I mean, it's one thing to talk in generalities about we need to be more contributing, more giving, more serving. We, you know, we need to have the right motivation. But sometimes it just comes down to how do I practically do this? Can I give you just three suggestions? I know you don't have a blank to write them down, but maybe you want to do it anyway. The first is just come up with a structure like this. The first one is would you just commit to some daily acts of goodness? Just some of those things where you bless somebody's life. Where you just every day, you're looking for something you can do. Call it a random act of kindness. Call it a way just to bless someone. But you do it as anonymously as possible. And you just say when you get up in the morning, Lord, who can I bless today? And you just do it. Dave Ferguson tells the story, uh, by the way, pastor at the Community Christian Church in Naperville, Illinois, tells a story about one day walking into a Kinko store. He knew one of the guys in there. He had just stopped at Starbucks, and he had you know, his coffee in his hand, and his buddy said to him, hey, where's mine? And Dave said, it just clicked for me that in this small store, I'm just going to buy everybody coffee. And he goes, I'm buying it. I'm getting everybody. And he bought four or five or six, whatever it was, for everybody's store. Went back down to Starbucks, brought them all back in. He says, it was like everybody won the lottery. They were so excited. He blogs about it a little bit later and just talks about this daily act of goodness, just this blessing in somebody else's life. Somebody else read that blog and said, Dave, I started a 365 club. It kind of uh, uh, upon what you started there, upon what you said, I I'm going to start a Facebook page where it talks about how just daily we look for ways to bless people. If you're a Facebook user, you go there, you can see there's over 10,000 friends now on this site who've just committed to be a part of daily doing some act of kindness. Would you just do that? Here's a second way that you can structure would you find just some ongoing thing that you can do on a regular basis? Some environment where you can serve on a regular basis. Get involved in some organized ministry. We have tons of those kinds of opportunities available for you here at the church. Something as simple as rocking little babies during a service. Something as simple as shaking hands. Something as simple as helping people find their seat as they come in. But you find some place where you can regularly, you have a commitment. You're doing that in, in some way. Maybe it's not in the church. Maybe it's outside in the community. We've got people who have committed weekly to show up at, at soup kitchens and to help out. Maybe that's what you do, but you find some organized way you can do that on a regular basis. And then here's the third one. You find something big this year and every year that you can do. You know, we offer lots of different mission trip opportunities. Maybe you've never done one of those, and maybe this is your year where you just say, I'm, I'm going to do that. 
I'm going to go on this trip to Mexico. I'm going to go on this trip to the to the uh, uh, Navajo reservation and help our men build. I'm going to I'm going to do something like that. Maybe for you, it's taking a week of vacation and you're going to serve as a faculty member at church camp. But but would you just commit to one big thing? Maybe it's you just grabbing some people and helping fix an elderly lady's home in North Tulsa. Maybe it's I don't know, but commit to something where you take a big project and you tackle it. Daily acts of kindness, an ongoing, regular ministry involvement, and third, some, some big thing that you can do this year where you can get a real taste of it. Church is a verb. We've talked about the idea of celebrating. We've talked about the idea of connecting. We've talked today about the idea of contributing. And really, all of those things are a part of what we call our Cedar Ridge discipleship process. We talk about asking you to take next steps. And what we're doing right now, we are celebrating in worship. And if that's where you've been and if that's what you've done, would you consider taking the next step? And that is connecting to a group. Maybe you've been coming, and now your next step is just to say, I want to be involved in some small group. I want to be involved in a a journey group. I I, I want to do that. If you're already in a group, we're going to ask you to take a next step. Would you consider contributing in ministry? Would you find some way within our church or even outside in the community through the outreach of our church? Would you find some way where you can contribute in ministry. The question for you to leave with today is, where are you? What's your next step? You know, really, there's a bigger question. And that's one these mighty men of David address for us today. What story of contributing will you be remembered? Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for just this story of men who risked their lives to make an incredible act of contribution. Father, thank you that it's written down, that we could read it, that we can be inspired by it, that we can make proper application of it to our lives. Father, would you help us to live like that? People who look for how we can serve others. Father, help it not just to be something that we we delegate to an area of our life, but would it be a lifestyle, a lifestyle of contributing. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.